start recording this program. Uh, we are now recording and want to welcome everybody to the uh, community infrastructure session of both junior and adult leadership Lake Norman. We've got some outstanding speakers uh, and I'm gonna, they're going to be showing some presentations. I regret that you can't actually attend some of the uh, community infrastructure that we had we were originally going to show you. We had the wastewater treatment plant and the water treatment plant and, and those are simply outstanding venues to see what they do and, and, and maybe we can uh, uh, at some particular point you get an opportunity to tour that. Uh, Warren Cooksey is going to be our first speaker. Warren is from NCDOT. Warren and I have known each other for probably 20 years. Uh, Warren uh, was at one point working for Wachovia Bank. Wasn't it Wachovia? First Union, Wachovia, Wells Fargo. They kept changing, <laughs> but my job stayed the same. And uh, a city council member. Of, wasn't it city council for the city of Charlotte? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So he has an extensive background both in finance, uh, also in politics, and, and now with NCDOT. So Warren, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you, and I've got your presentation, and I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing that screen. All right, thank you, Bill. Uh, it's been a, a privilege for the past few years to respond to Bill's request to come to the uh, Leadership Lake Norman group and talk about how a road gets built. So that's what I'm gonna do. Now, this is not about concrete and asphalt and that sort of thing. This is more the policy direction of how a road gets built. Because I think if you're uh, you're interested in leadership in the Lake Norman area, you know this this process I'm about to explain is is what you'll need to, to keep in mind if transportation infrastructure in general and roadway infrastructure in particular is of interest to you. So, Bill, let's get started. Next, a uh, key background point to start with is uh, understanding the highway divisions. You don't have to go into a lot of detail about this, but DOT looks at the state and has been since the mid 50s uh, in these 14 different highway divisions. It is through the divisions that operations, maintenance, uh, construction oversight, and uh, in some cases, project design occurs. So here in Mecklenburg County, we are part of Division 10 along with Cabarrus, Stanley, Anson, and Union Counties. You'll see variations of this map throughout my presentation and you'll hear the significance of divisions as, as we continue to go along. So I want to get that point made up front. Uh, next up, Bill, uh, a second key background point to be aware of is the state maintained road network. Um, North Carolina is rare among states in the country in that county governments are not involved in construction or maintenance of roadways. The state took over the county road systems back during the depression in the 1930s. So it can be a bit tricky figuring some of that out. Now, the easy part are you know, any road that you see with a shield on the screen there, you know, an interstate shield, a US shield, a North Carolina route shield, those are easy to figure out that they're part of the NCDOT system. But when you go to the next slide and you see something like the uh, corner of when you go to the next slide, I'm sorry, I'm being too smooth in my transitions. <laughs> uh, when you see something like the corner of Harborside Drive and West Catawba Avenue, there's nothing there that tells you that West Catawba Avenue is actually an NCDOT maintained road. And yet it is, um, going all the way back to the, the Depression era. Actually, that part of West Catawba used to be NC73, but that's history we won't go into. So if you go to the next slide and overlay all the state maintained roads in the Lake Norman area, you can see that both in Division 10 in Mecklenburg and Division 12 in Ardell, there are probably a lot more roads that are state responsibilities than you, you may have thought. And uh, it all goes back to that depression area of this. So that's a key background and point to understand about how a road gets built is that if you're driving on a road, it's either gonna be a state responsibility or a municipal responsibility. You don't have to worry about you know, lobbying a county for any kind of road improvement. So next up, uh, I've divided the process into five stages, uh, regional planning, prioritization, and funding, project planning, project design, and construction. We're going to spend most of our time on prioritization and funding, but got to get to the regional planning part first. So thing to understand about regional planning, next slide. Um, this is going to be tricky because I had this animated, but well. Uh, Bill, could you click on the state of North Carolina? Highlight it. State of North Carolina, okay. Yeah, just click anywhere on it and hit delete. Let yeah. me get that mask off. And I'll adapt to this method of presentation. Uh, yeah, all right. So the map that you see 
uh, in addition to showing the 14 highway divisions, uh, shows you the boundaries of organizations called metropolitan and rural planning organizations. These groups have the primary responsibility for planning the regional transportation network. Um, one of the things that makes them different is that a metropolitan planning organization is actually a creation under federal law. Rural planning organizations fill in the gaps based on state law. And in the inset there, for Ardell County, Mecklenburg County, and most of Union County, um, the Metropolitan Planning Organization is known as the Charlotte Regional Transportation Planning Organization, CARPO for short. And it is made up of elected officials from each of the jurisdictions you see from the three counties. Uh, they form a policy-making board that under federal law handles regional transportation planning for those three counties. Well, most of Union County, not all of it. Uh, to go to the next slide, uh, I guess I could trigger it by saying Bill to go to the next slide. One document to be aware of that they are, are responsible for is called the Comprehensive Transportation Plan. Uh, this is an aspirational plan. It, it's basically lines on a map, but it covers, as you can see, four modes, highway, bicycle, pedestrian, and public transportation. Um, these aren't projects. This isn't something hard and fast. This is just if there's any notion that a roadway needs improvement or a new roadway should be built, it needs to be a line on one of these maps. Uh, the uh, custodianship of the Comprehensive Transportation Plan is a state law requirement, but MPOs and RPOs are responsible for them for their various jurisdictions. Uh, Bill, the next slide. Uh, whoops, delete, that was supposed to be hidden. That's too much detail. Go to the next slide. I hid that one. I forgot to delete it. Uh, not enough time to go into detail there. The other plan to be aware of at CARPO's level is called the Metropolitan Transportation Plan, just to confuse things a bit. Uh, this is a federally required plan. And as you can see, it's got a time window to it. It covers roughly a 25 year period. It's updated every four to five years. And this plan contains actual projects that the MPO believes there's a reasonable chance to get funded over the next 25 year period for the plan. Um, so the first step, if there's something you wanna see done is to make sure it's a proper line on the map for the CTP at the CARPO level. The second is to make sure the project you're interested in is included in a metropolitan transportation plan. Uh, and you have a chance to uh, give feedback for the creation of it roughly every four years or so. The CTP is an ongoing process because it's, it's aspirational, it's not an actual project yet. So that's the background on regional planning that you need to know if you want a project to happen, it needs to be in these plans. So next, Bill, next up, uh, that's a sample of it, don't have time for that, hit that as well. Um, so that's regional planning. Let's delve and spend most of our time with the prioritization and funding process. So Bill, the next slide. I'll start with the, uh, not that one, previous one, there we go. Uh, in fiscal year 19, the last full fiscal year we had, um, NCDOT had about $5 billion of revenue. You can see in the obligatory PowerPoint pie chart there how that was divided. Most of it came from the state motor fuel tax, a good chunk from the federal motor fuel tax, the highway use tax that you pay when you buy a car, DMV registrations and so on. So that, that was the source of our revenue in 2019. You'll notice there's no general income tax money there, no general sales tax money there. It's all transportation related revenue sources. Uh, the next slide, Bill, shows how that was spent in FY19. You can see just over half was spent on construction, uh, most of that in a fund called the Highway Trust Fund. A little more than a quarter for maintenance, uh, and then a bunch of other smaller uh, allocations for the use of the revenue. I draw your attention to the very bottom of this, uh, of this pie chart explanation and we see municipal aid. Uh, this is 147.5 million that was distributed to municipalities out of state transportation revenues uh, for the municipalities to use on their local road networks, however, however they need to do that. Maintenance, perhaps some construction. Um, it's called uh, Powell Bill money in the jargon of municipal policy. Uh, but that's part of how the revenue is used. Uh, how that construction money out of the Highway Trust Fund is used, excellent transition bill, uh, is based on a law passed in 2013 called the Strategic Transportation Investments Law. As you can see there, officially known as an act to strengthen the economy through strategic transportation investments. Uh, in this law, the legislature completely revamped how we did construction, prioritization, and funding. And so I'll take you through that very, very briefly. Um, the, the internal slide deck for this is 90 slides long, so you're getting a real high-level view here. To start with, uh, 
the responsibilities for the process were divided by the law. So the legislature, as is appropriate, since it's the lawmaking body, kicked things off by defining that overall process in the law and identified goals of the, of the transportation system. For example, congestion relief. Yes, pr prior to 2013, congestion relief wasn't a statutory reason for building out our, our transportation network. Next, uh, we, uh, it delegated to NCDOT to quantify those goals, which our Board of Transportation does, and then apply them to projects, which the, uh, which the very talented staff at the Strategic Prioritization Office of Transportation does, taking the formulas adopted by the board and applying them to every project. So for example, congestion equals volume versus capacity. Now we come back to this map and where the projects come from is again, the MPOs, the RPOs, and division engineers. So legislators don't submit projects directly. Uh, state transportation board members don't submit projects directly. The projects come directly for scoring from MPOs, RPOs, and division engineers. So having split the responsibilities, we next turn to how the money is divided. So next up, 40% of the money available is uh, allocated by state statute to what are known as statewide mobility projects. There is a definition in the statute, but what it roughly translates to is all the interstates in the state and certain U.S. routes, uh, such as U.S. 74 in uh, CARPO's jurisdiction. Um, the definition just says that 40% of construction funding would be applied to projects that come from MPOs, RPOs, and division engineers that are geared towards these specific roadways, interstates, and some U.S. routes. Next, 30% go to regional impact projects. And uh, you can kind of see here that every division is paired with another to form a region. So although we have 14 divisions, we have seven regions. Each region gets its own bag of money out of this slice of construction funding that totals 30% of the available funds. So it divides, it doesn't divide evenly because it goes um, by population of the region. But each region gets a sum of money uh, to allocate towards regional impact projects, which are all the other U.S. routes, all the NC routes, and if it chooses to do so, MPOs and RPOs can also apply the regional money to a statewide project. Can't, can't use statewide money on a regional project, but it does go the other way. Next up, the remaining 30% uh, is for division needs project, and this is divided equally amongst the 14 divisions so that each has about the same amount of money uh, to spend on division needs. And that's gonna be your secondary road network, such as West Catawba Avenue, something that doesn't have a shield. That said, statewide, back up one, <laughs> uh, statewide or regional projects can, it's called cascade down into the division level. So if there's a really, if there's a statewide or regional project that didn't get funded in its own category, it could be funded out of division needs if an MPO or an RPO wants to do so. So that's how the money's divided. Now we'll talk about scoring. So next up, Bill. Uh, when we apply the formulas that the Board of Transportation adopts under the STI law in the percentages that the Board adopts, the, um, you know, the folks on NCDOT staff then can score every project based on those formulas. So what you see here first is how the statewide, you know, what formulas apply to statewide mobility. We've got congestion and freight and safety and so on. Uh, the key point to note here is that statewide mobility projects, these big statewide projects, are funded based on the data score alone. Uh, nobody can vote to defund a project or you know, add a, a specific project. They can be funded only based on how well they score under this system. Next, however, on the regional impact level, 70% um, of its score is based on data. The remaining 30% is based on local input. I'll explain what that means in a moment because, Bill, next, you can see that local input's an even more significant part of division needs. So for a division needs project, half of its score is based on the data from formulas. The remaining half is from local input. And as you may have guessed, that local input, next, Bill, comes again from the MPOs and the RPOs and the division engineers. It doesn't come from the state board or the state legislature. Uh, that said, um, even at that level of local input points, those groups must adopt a methodology for how they will assign points. They can't just sit around the table and say, I like that project, put points on it. They have to create a process for applying those points. So all of this is very complex and layered and, and difficult to follow, 
but it creates a system of extraordinary transparency where I can tell you to a decimal point why a project does or does not get funded. Uh, all of this, next bill, uh, leads to a document called the State Transportation Improvement Program, which is a 10-year program of work applying all the construction funds estimated to be available to all the projects statewide at those three levels that successfully achieve funding uh, through the STI process. Uh, that said, although it's a 10-year document, it does get updated about every two years. So this is an ongoing process, working through your MPO with the division, with the division engineer on uh, continually updating this program based on the STI law. Uh, skip, uh, well, Bill, the, if you ever want to read it, this is what a page of it looks like. Won't go into the detail there. That's uh, another topic. Close on the uh, State Transportation Improvement Program by noting there is a much greater demand for projects than funding available. In the last round of, of scoring that created the most recent STIP, the Statewide Transportation Improvement Program, you can see there uh, less than $13 billion worth of projects actually were able to get funded. Near, uh, 41 billion plus were, had to be left on the table for future rounds of funding because there just wasn't enough funding to meet all the needs that were submitted by the MPOs, RPOs, and division engineers across the state. So next up, rushing through this a bit, uh, that's our prioritization funding. Want to spend a little time on project planning because that's another key element for public input. Uh, next up, Bill, you see most projects are going to have an environmental document under either the state or national environmental policy act. Uh, it'll look something like this. Uh, there are different types, there are different levels of detail that they go into. But any project with any federal funding is going to follow the National Environmental Policy Act or NEPA. Any project that is funded purely through state money will follow the state environmental document process. Uh, but there's this end result um, that must be done before a project uh, can proceed. Uh, next up, you see one example of something that is looked at. Environment is a very broad uh, category of things that are evaluated, but one that's fairly obvious for the national side of things is looking for federally protected species in a project area. So if any of these five species gets found in a proposed project area, it adds complications to the delivery of the ultimate delivery of that project. There's some ways to mitigate it, but we deal with it. Next up, uh, and why I wanna focus on this particular part of the process is that public meetings are crucial for this. Once a project is funded and it's going to go forward, uh, then there are several iterations of public meetings uh, to seek public input on the design. Now, one of the key things to note about this stage of the process is the project is going to happen at this phase. It is funded, the funding is locked in. I see so many people who show up at these meetings saying, I don't want this project. That decision was made when the project was submitted for funding. And if it, if it scored well enough for funding, it's gonna eventually get constructed. Uh, but these public meetings are about the design. Uh, so next slide, uh, Bill. You can see there will be public meeting maps where folks can see what the preliminary designs are under the environmental document. They can provide feedback on where new intersections might go, or how the widening would work, whether it goes you know, to the left of the existing uh, roadway, to the right, that kind of thing. Um, and next up, you can follow all of this for your higher profile projects on ncdot.gov's website under projects. You can see these project maps when a public meeting has been held. Um, so that's the project planning process. Project design, I don't need to spend a lot of time on because it's extraordinarily technical and it takes basically that public feedback and gets a project ready for bid. Uh, the designers, the engineers go from these broad designs that are shown at the public meeting maps to the next slide, much more detailed uh, drawings that uh, roadways can actually be built from. So this is where the professionals really, uh, really hunker down and convert the general ideas into these specific types of documents. It's at this stage, next up, thanks Bill, that we also look at the specific uh, right of way that needs to be identified and acquired for any roadway improvement project. Uh, next up, we also at this stage are looking at uh, utility relocations. There are lots of utilities that are located in rights of way and if a roadway is going to be expanded into the existing right of way, a new right of way has to get purchased, that typically means utilities have to be relocated as well. So we've got to spend time identifying them and giving those utilities that opportunity. Now we're ready for construction and I'm about out of time. Uh, so I'm not gonna talk much about this construction. Um, this is how a road gets built and gets to that point. Uh, next up, if you wanna see future projects statewide or more particularly for the Lake Norman area, 
uh, look up uh, NCDOT STIP map in your favorite search engine. Uh, it'll lead you to a map similar to this. You can zoom in on the area. Uh, future projects are highlighted. You can click on the project and see some details. See in particular the TIP Transportation Improvement Program ID number, uh, which is a way to look it up in the State Transportation Progr Improvement Program, see some ideas. I wouldn't give too much credence to dates though, um, because as you may have heard, not just with coronavirus, but even before then, this is an article from last September. Um, we've had a series of financial hits to the department uh, over the past couple of years from um, certain court rulings about uh, decades old legislation uh, that affected uh, the value of people's property when it was required, for, it was expected to be required for right of way, uh, to hurricane relief to now, and this is pre-coronavirus, now as you may have seen recently, um, we have for the first time, uh, our cash reserves are below the floor uh, for the state law. So a lot of the dates are going to be uncertain at this point. Um, but to that end, if there are any questions, Bill, I'll turn things back over to you to identify for questions and I'll try to answer them the best I can. Well, we've got uh, uh, some other stuff. So does anybody have a specific question of Warren? We got time for maybe one or two questions before we move to Mayor Anarella. Um, all right, well, Warren, thank you so very much for joining us. I'll, I'll hang around a bit in case, uh, in case the mayor is better at soliciting questions from people that, uh, that uh, may wind up being NCDOT turf. Uh, so I won't pay him on, well, he won't have to be put on the spot for that. Okay. So I'll hang for the next, for a while. All right, I'm going to uh, recognize John Anarella. John is the mayor for the town of Huntersville, serving his, is this two term? This is second term now, right? Second, third, third term. Yes, yes, yes. Should have known that. Third term. Uh, uh, John also has a business bulldog asset management, and uh, he has been a past president of the Kiwanis Club and, and one of our state officers in Kiwanis. Very involved. And John is going to cover what are some of the road improvement projects specifically to Huntersville because of all the municipalities in Cornelius Davis and Huntersville. Huntersville has, I think, we said six hundred million dollars worth of road improvement projects that are slated. So John, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to share the screen uh, that you sent over. And uh, if you want to walk us through some of the pro uh, projects that we've got looking uh, taking place. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you everybody. And thank you, Warren. I know uh, some of you might have said, wow, that is really complicated way of getting uh, roads uh, funded and on the map here. Uh, but I can tell you, it's a heck of a lot better than it used to be when uh, Senator so-and-so called his buddy and said, hey, I need to get a road through this area. And the buddy said, you know, whatever, whoever he was, oh, yeah, okay, well, let's get it done. So that process that you just saw has been going on for probably about seven or eight years. And um, it has really helped the way road funding is going throughout the state. And what I mean by that as an example, what you're looking at right now are funded road projects in Huntersville. And I had asked our staff uh, a few years ago, I said, you know, we, we have all these projects that are going to be funded, but I don't know when they're happening and where they're happening and so forth. So five years ago, four or five years ago, when I first became mayor, we probably had about $250 million worth of road, state road projects combined with some town road projects. Right now, that number is about $600 million. And why is that? Well, because of the uh, formulas that have been put in place, including what Warren had said about congestion, uh, there's also economic development and growth and all these other uh, things that go into it, Huntersville, was woefully behind in terms of our infrastructure and really quite frankly all of North Mecklenburg and Mecklenburg County in general. So uh, as we went into the formula based and then instead of the good old boy based, uh, all our numbers started uh, going through this process and uh, basically what you see in front of you are a lot of projects that are funded. And why, why I say that is uh, some of that funding may be slipping from one year to the next, but at least as of right now, we're not having to go out and compete 
against other potential road projects. So what you see right here, all the green circles are projects that are state projects in Huntersville. The yellow circle is, uh, and Bill's dog, uh, the yellow circle is, are projects that may get funded and they're going into a, the process that Warren just talked to, to you about. The pentagons, which are the um, uh, you know, brownish uh, are town and or combined town, state, federal projects. So those are the projects that the town is leading on. And then, um, Bill, why don't you go to that next slide, if you have that. So uh, it's a little unclear if you can make that a little bit uh, Yes, okay, especially for us older than 50, it's hard to see. But the corresponding numbers that you saw on those pre the previous page uh, are what you are seeing now. So one of the main projects through Huntersville, Cornelius, and Davidson is the Highway 73 project, which um, I think on there was, uh, I gotta get it here, four and five, eight, no, it was eight and five and four, yeah, eight, five and four. So that is like a $200 million project. It goes all the way from uh, the Catawba River to I-85 and actually extends past those two, but those are part of other projects because they go into other municipalities. Um, so some of the things that are happening in Huntersville, if you live in our area, uh, which I assume you do, uh, that the town is very involved in is the, um, you can go back to that other, uh, yeah, there you go. Uh, the, the ones that the town is uh, really involved in is our Main Street project, which uh, most people don't know. We do have a Main Street, just see our little downtown area over there. Um, that is already starting. And we, um, with, this, with the state as well as federal government, um, have received a, I don't know, 10 or $11 million plus the, the town's kicking in seven or so, uh, seven or eight, uh, to improve or really create a bypass from Highway 15 through the downtown area. So you might have seen a lot of clearing, some buildings, some houses are no longer there. Those are going to be two uh, bookended uh, roundabouts, one on the north side, one on the south. So if you want to go through Huntersville quickly on 115, you'll just drive right through those roundabouts and head up north or south. But if you want to go east, or if you're coming from the north and want to go west, and you slowly want to go through our downtown, you'll take Main Street, which will be adjacent to the railroad tracks. Uh, so that's a project that we have been really working on. The town has been talking about that for about 20 years. Um, some of the other projects of note have really been dependent on the state, you know, all those uh, interchanges on I-77, uh, Gilead Road, we're gonna get another uh, bridge on Gilead. Um, so whereas exit 28 is a diverging diamond, uh, exit 23 will be a double diverging diamond. Uh, and it should work very well because we have a lot more room than uh, Cornelius did. Uh, exit 25 is going to get a, a south exit as well as a north exit. So there'll be actually three exits uh, right around there. And uh, that should help with our local traffic. So one of the things that NCDOT is trying to do is uh, create more uh, local exit entrances and exits and then allow uh, cross uh, east-west or north-south traffic to uh, go where you know, somebody's coming into the town or they're going through the town as opposed to us just trying to get from one place to another during the, uh, the day. Um, in addition to all these other projects that you see here, uh, especially the ones that are town, on, uh, town run, those are mostly intersection improvements. So Hambright Road and um, Mount Holly Huntersville Road or Hambright Road and Beatty Sword Road um, you know, we all know that those were just two lane roads and if you ever get stuck behind somebody going left or right, uh, you're going to be there for a while. So we are focused right now on 
trying to widen those roads so people can make right turns or at least uh, wait in, a, in an area so they can make a right or left turn. What's happening now with NCDOT, as Warren had alluded to, uh, they've had a, a budget shortfall. Uh, some, I would say, due to um, mis misplanning or not being able to predict well enough the cost of, uh, of roads and then some of the other things that Warren had indicated. However, from the town of Huntersville standpoint, uh, we have a good amount of cash right now, and it's our focus to try to accelerate as many of our projects as we can uh, to try to go out and uh, now possibly not compete as much with uh, an NCDOT project or other projects around uh, the United States or even uh, locally, especially locally. Um, so we, what I think you'll see from Huntersville is an acceleration of as many projects as we can get out the door, uh, because assuming that unfortunately there are uh, you know, layoffs occurring, uh, but potentially the cost of doing some of this construction uh, should be a lot less. And if you think about it, um, asphalt you know, is an oil-based product, and uh, with the price of oil, asphalt uh, should be a lot lower uh, right now. And um, so we're somewhat excited about that. The thing that I'm not excited about is uh, all these projects that you see that are in green, they've been there for at least three of the four, four three or four of the years I've been mayor. And for the most part, none of them have started construction yet. <laughs> so uh, they're all been delayed and, and those we don't have control over. Uh, so that's why the town is going to accelerate as many of our projects as we can. So, Bill, I know that's a high-level overview, but I'll uh, take any questions on anything else, uh, any specifics. Um, Warren had about 40 slides. I only had two. So. <laughs> Are there any questions of, of Mayor Anarella or uh, Warren? Do you have anything you would like to add to what John just talked about? Absolutely not. Thank hey. you. Mayor Anarello, it's Vicki from Big Day at the Lake. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. So you know what I'm going to ask you. First of all, I'd like to give kudos out because I um, put in a request to have them fix a pothole in front of my house. I think it was last Wednesday and they were out here by Thursday fixing it. Oh, well, good. Right there. That's a town pothole then. Oh, that's all right. Hey, you can take credit for it anyway. <laughs> So how's my uh, my Gilead Road, Vance Road connection going? When is that going to start? Um, well, actually, that should start, let me just see on my uh, little chart here. Uh, next year, it should construction. Awesome. July, July of next year. And Thank we're you. all putting bollards, uh, you know, off of Mercer Road, so people aren't going to be able to make lefts. Yeah, I, I know. <laughs> That'll be good. Thank you. Great presentation, you. both of you. But Thank you. Uh, uh, Vicki, that, that chart that's on the presentation shows every road project when it's supposed to start and the oh, cost, and obviously when it's funded. So. And so we'll get a copy of that, right, Bill? Yeah, Mayor, what I'm going to do is I will send the uh, copy of the YouTube video to all participants, but I'm going to, since the uh, John's handout was very deta detailed, I will make sure that I also attach the PDF that John sent that uh, talks about the specific road projects. So, any other questions Thank for Mayor Morello and Warren Cooksey? Well, thank you both. You're, you're it's an easy crowd. You're yes, welcome, indeed. Welcome to stay on the line uh, and watch uh, Duke Energy, or uh, you're you can go on your way. I'm leaving. See ya. That's some, got some work to do. Thanks, everybody. Good luck, John. Thank you. Our next presentation is uh, John Crutchfield with Duke Energy. John is a member of the Lake Norman Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors and uh, also very big in the environmental aspect of, of Duke Energy. Uh, John, I'm going to go ahead and uh, share your screen on, on yours and uh, you can begin walking us through your presentation. Okay, thank you, Bill, and good afternoon to all the participants uh, today. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. Uh, what I'd like to do is talk to, talk to you today of how we produce power, put it on the grid, and deliver it to your home and businesses 
and uh, how we're shaping our power production in the future to achieve a net zero carbon emission uh, uh, goal that we have. I'll try to give some basics in Electricity 101 and how electricity is produced, and then give some examples of power plants to show you a different power plant of how the energy is actually produced through those power plants. But just to start off with um, our, our Duke Energy Service Territory, we have a regulated service, uh, service territory in um, six states. And let me see if I can, Bill, how do I? Well, I'm, I'll, I'm gonna tr change them for you. Okay, there we go. Uh, we, we have a regulated electric service uh, territory, which includes six states and about 7.8 million customers. And what I mean by regulated electric service utility is that in each of those states, we are accountable to a utilities uh, commission, which is a politically appointed commission. Uh, and we have to, they uh, determine what our rates are for not only residential uh, uh, customers, but uh, uh, that includes uh, commercial and industrial customers. And we have periodic rate cases, and you probably have heard of them in the news, well, when we go before those utilities commission to recoup our costs, and that's what our operating costs are, and then any capital costs that we have in terms of capital improvements, equipment uh, improvements, and power plants, as well as new power plants. So that's what I mean by regula regula regulated uh, electric utility. Um, and then, you know, our rates are, are determined upon our expenses, and then it gives us a rate of return on our investment. We also have a regulated gas business, uh, as most of y'all aware, and that serves 1.6 million customers in the Carolinas, Tennessee, and Ohio, and Kentucky. Overall, we have, in terms of electric generation, about 51,000 megawatts, and I'll talk about what megawatts means in terms of currency in a few slides. That uh, elect gener uh, electric generation is uh, uh, distributed over 36 miles, 36,000 miles of transmission lines. And those are the big lines you see uh, in the area. There can be 500 uh, uh, kV or kilovolt lines uh, that you see on those big steel towers. That's what I mean by transmission line. And then over 280,000 miles of distribution lines. And those are lines, those wires that go out to businesses and, and homes that distribute the energy from those uh, transmission lines. Duke Energy Renewables is what we call our unregula unregulated side of the company. Uh, they operate 22 wind turbine and 126 solar farms, 11 fuel cells, and then one battery storage facility we have, which is about 36 megawatts out in Texas for a, a wind farm out there. That's about 22, almost 2,300 uh, additional megawatts of capacity, and that's across 19 states, and that mainly is the wind and um, the solar, and that's mainly out in the Midwest and Western part of the, of the uh, United States. The, the, the commercial or non-regulated, we sell that on the open market to other utilities. We also purchase it, the regulated utility, and we also uh, uh, sell it to large companies like Amazon, Facebook, and other companies like that in terms of the unregulated market. This shows on the regulated side our generation mix, uh, the pie chart, uh, you can see almost equal amounts we produce now with nuclear and natural gas. Uh, coal is about 26%, and then hydro and solar combined is about 6%, and then uh, less than 1% is currently is oil. Now, the electric generation mix you're seeing on the left in that table, that includes both regulated and unregulated uh, generation on, on a, a nationwide basis, so it's not... A, uh, exactly apples to apples, but you can see it's comparable in terms of natural gas uh, and coal. We have uh, uh, more in terms of nuclear capacity. If you took our uh, uh, unregulated side of the company, the renewable side of the company, and put in those megawatts, then our, our megawatt, our, our generation mix will be comparable to that 18%. I will stop and say here, if you look at what our uh, current generation capacity in terms of, uh, of carbon-free emissions, uh, we have about 40 percent. And a nuclear does not emit any kind of carbon uh, dioxide into the atmosphere as opposed to coal-fired coal plants uh, and, 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 um, and, and gas-fired plants. 
um, we have, um, we are shaping our generation between now and 2050 to achieve a net zero carbon emissions by 2050. Uh, and so you'll see that coal by 2050, we will retire all our coal fired plants. Uh, we, our strategy is to increase our renewables. That's both solar and wind. Uh, we will also be using um, the uh, natural gas in, 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 our, uh, in our generation mix in that time period. Uh, of course, natural gas does not emit as much carbon dioxide as coal fire plant. It doesn't have the, by, the byproducts uh, associated with uh, uh, the emissions as coal does. We, continue, we will continue to run our nuclear fleet uh, which we have six nuclear sites with 11 units. Uh, those plants, we will be looking, the nuclear plants, looking at extending the nuclear licenses. Uh, currently, uh, we've, the, those plants were initially licensed with 40 years. We've gone through uh, one relicensing and we'll be extending that for another, uh, uh, one relicensing for 20 years renewal. And then we'll be looking at extending them for another 20 years. So operating those nuclear plants for 80 years. And you may say, gosh, that's a long time. Yes, it is, but those plants are well-maintained. Uh, the systems are kept up current in terms of the uh, state-of-the-art equipment, and they will be a part of our, our strategy to get to that net carbon zero. Just to give a perspective on coal fire plants, we have retired uh, about 51 coal fire units representing about 6.6 .6 gigawatts of electricity since 2010. Um, we have reduced our carbon emissions by 39% since 2005. Uh, by 2030, we, we will hit the 50% mark and then achieve net zero on, on, on those emissions by 2050. So certainly, uh, uh, a, a, you'll see a dramatic turn in the way we produce electricity. It's, you've already seen it in terms of what we have. Um, but one thing I want to emphasize here as we go through these next slides, to meet our electric, electricity uh, demands, we have to have more than one type of generation source or generation uh, plant. It's not one source can make one, sit, one size fits all. It has to be a variety of, of sources uh, to, to achieve uh, our generation capacity, meet the needs of our customers. Bill, next slide, please. This just shows for uh, our generation resources in the Carolinas, we have about 33,000 megawatts of capacity of various plants, supporting about 4 million customers. And our baseload plants, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about baseload and peaking means in just a, in just a minute, but our baseload plants are nuclear, coal and combined cycle combustion turbine. That's a natural gas type of uh, turbine um, or, or provided uh, by natural gas. Uh, those mean, base loaders means they run constantly uh, to meet the, the, the generation demands uh, at, a, at a certain level. Our peaking uh, facilities, that's to meet the peak demands either in the morning or afternoon, depending on if it's winter or spring. That includes simple cycle combustion turbines, and again, those are natural gas. And these combustion turbines, what I'm talking about, natural gas uh, combustion turbines, think of a big jet engine. That's what they are, um, it essentially, is a big jet engine turbine. Um, also in Peking, we have pump storage. We have two stations, uh, Joe Cassie and Bad Creek down in South Carolina, that we use to meet our peaking demands. And then we have conventional hydro, like on Lake Norman at Cowan's Ford Hydro, we have 31 stations to achieve that. Um, and then our renewable, uh, currently we use solar and we also have, we have solar farms that we uh, own and operate or we purchase solar from entities. Uh, we have some biomass, uh, either animal waste that we purchase from uh, energy companies or wood chips. Currently we don't have any wind in North Carolina. Our wind is on the non-regulated uh, renewable side. Uh, in fact, the only wind farm in North Carolina is up the northeast uh, of North Carolina near Elizabeth City. I think it's around 200 megawatts, which provides uh, energy for uh, Amazon up in Virginia. But we are interested in developing wind in the future in, in, in the Carolinas. 
just to talk about electric currency, because I've been throwing about what megawatts are for this and that, one megawatt hour, that means one million watts used over for one hour or a thousand kilowatts over one hour. One megawatt can power about 750 homes uh, to give a perspective of the amount of energy. Uh, to give you an example of, of kilowatt hours and megawatt hours, if you take 10 100 watt light bulbs and you put the, turn them on at the same time, that equals a thousand watts or one kilowatt hour if they're kept on for one hour. So that's one kilowatt hour. In a typical residential home, we use about a little over 800 um, kilowatt hours per month. Okay, Bill, next slide. Again, this is a very simple method to show how we produce electricity uh, for um, nuclear, uh, coal, gas, and oil. Of course, we either use fission for nuclear or use coal, coal gas, or oil as a burner. Uh, we turn water into steam, which drives the turbine there, you can see, uh, which goes, in, uh, which turns the generator, and a generator consists of two major elements, a stator, which is the windings uh, uh, around, uh, uh, which is the housing, which is cons consists of copper wi windings, and then the rotor, which actually turns, which is uh, made of magnets. That creates the electromagnetic field which causes the flow of electrons, and that produces energy which goes out onto the system. For wind and uh, water, you can see at the top, the wind or the water drives the turbine. There does, there's no heating of water, obviously, with those, which turns the turbine and produces electricity. For solar, uh, photovoltaic cells uh, are, are uh, used to produce current in there, and I'll talk just briefly about those in a few minutes. Bill, next slide. I was talking about base load versus peaking, and this is a very simple schematic. Base load is the amount of, of electricity over 24 hours schedule that's pretty, pretty consistent. That's the amount of electricity that's required just as a base load. Hospitals, uh, firm, uh, companies, residents that use just on a constant basis. The peaking is like if you get up in the morning, you're making breakfast, you, the heat goes, cup kicks on in the winter, you see a rise of, of, of electrical demand in the morning that will typically tapers off and then it will peak in the evening. Uh, as people come home, electric, uh, either air conditioning cuts on, they turn up the heat or whatnot. So we need different types of energy sources to meet the peaking demands and the baseload demands. In the winter, our peak is mainly in the um, morning when it's coldest, the heat usually is on. Uh, that, that switches in the summer, our, our peak is usually in the evening uh, when air conditioning gets hot, air conditioning comes on uh, and, and those activities. Typically during this time of period, during the spring or the fall is when we have power plant outages where the peaks are not, and electric demand is not as quite as high, that's when we, have uh, our maintenance outages for our plants. I will mention, you know, COVID-19 has affected businesses, closed businesses, it's affected us. Our base load has decreased uh, due to, you know, electrical demand, Indus uh, businesses have closed, industries have, uh, have shut down. So our, our electrical generation demand has decreased in terms of what we are, are seeing as well, and as well as our revenues too. So it's impacted us from that perspective in terms of decreased electrical demand. Bill, next slide. Uh, this is shows uh, a nuclear a plant like McGuire um, on Lake Norman. This is a pressurized, which is a pressurized water reactor. It consists of a nuclear core um, or reactor vessel in the middle and it has two steam generators. Uh, I won't get in particular, but just the the, react, uh, the fuel source is uranium. It's in the reactor vessel. There are control rods which emit neutrons. Those are lowered to start the nuclear reaction, which is free neutrons strike the uranium uh, um, atoms, which are free neutrons, and that's the fission process. That releases heat, which is given off into the water surrounding that nuclear core, and that water circulated into those, those big steam generators, which uh, has water in it, which produces steam. Those steam lines drive the turbine, as you can see, which goes out to the generator and then to the transformer. And generally, all of our transformers 
we have to step up the voltage from the power plant out onto these large transmission lines because we do, we do lose energy those long distances. When it goes into your house, it's stepped down. It goes into a switch yard, and then it goes out to distribution lines and transformers there where you see it steps down to 120 or 200 volts. So that's what transformers are for, either step up or step down the power. After that steam uh, turns the turbine, it goes through a condenser box, which takes water, cool water from a lake, and that lake water circulates through tubes, and it, it converts that steam back to water, and then that, that water goes back into those steam generators uh, to complete the process. Bill, next slide. This shows a coal, a coal fire plant, and again, um, you know, coal comes into, the, into a plant, it's taken and pulverized into a very fine powder. That uh, powder is injected into a big boiler. The boiler is typically uh, initially fired by natural gas, another ignition source, it gets it warm, and then it turns, uh, uh, a series of tubes turns that um, water circulated in those tubes into steam, which goes into the steam line, drives the turbine, uh, and goes in the generator. And, and the same, same process in terms of cooling the water back down and going through those steam lines. I will say that the precipitator and scrubber you there, uh, what you see is precipitator uh, takes out the fine ash. The scrubber uh, reduces the, the, the gases such as uh, sulfur dioxide and nitrogen dioxide. Typically, the, the, our ash used to be sluiced into wet ash. We no longer do that. Uh, we're phasing out, as you know, we're closing our ash ponds, all our ash now on the existing plants is collected in the dry. Uh, and as I mentioned, we are closing all our ash ponds, which will be completed uh, by 2038. Bill, next slide. This shows a combined cycle power plant, uh, which uses natural gas. The natural gas, um, it, it, why it's called combined cycle, it has two different ways to generate electricity. The natural gas fires that big jet uh, turbine, uh, which produces electricity, as you can see on the left-hand side. The waste heat after that goes through a recovery steam generator, which produces steam, which drives another turbine, uh, which produces electricity. A, a simple cycle would only consist of the, of the turbine itself and not the, the secondary steam generator. So this is a much more efficient way to generate electricity by capturing the waste heat uh, and utilizing that again. Next one. This shows uh, a typical hydro plant, uh, like Cowan's Ford. You have a reservoir, an intake, the water's taken through the penstock, it turns a, a turbine, uh, which turns the generator and creates electricity. Very simple uh, technology, hasn't changed much in the last 100 years. In fact, some of our, our hydro plants are, are 100 years old. Very reliable, durable technology. The potential energy here that can be produced is the reservoir level on the left versus the outflow or tailwater level at the bottom, which is the amount of net head. The higher the head, the more potential energy, the more you can generate. Uh, the lower head, the less potential energy and the less you can generate. And of course, hydro is limited in drought situations. And then finally, uh, uh, solar and wind, not the least, but our solar panels, uh, you know, or photovoltaic cells, they take the photons of the sun, capture those, they hit and excite uh, um, those photo photovoltaic cells, that's a mouthful, excuse me, which excites electrons and it produces electricity. Now, solar panels produce direct current that has to go into a, a, a transformer or inverter to convert it to a alternating current to go out on the system, and that's what you see in the back with a switch yard. And of course, those panels can be tilted during the time of the day to, to maximize sunlight exposure, as well as uh, during the spring or fall. And then on the right, wind turbines, uh, uh, they can orient, of course, obviously, to optimize the wind, and the, the blades can be turned to, to, uh, at a certain pitch to, to, minimize, to maximize the wind potential capture. And the generators and those are at the top of each of those wind turbines and they're um, uh, captured and the energy goes out to a substation. 
So, Bill, I think what I'll do is the, the uh, other remaining slides talk a lot about hydropower. I'm not going to get it too much in those, but I will talk about slide 14 briefly. Uh, you know, Lake Norman's in our backyard. Uh, the Catawba Water Re River system um, is, is, a, um, uh, is a very hard working river system in North Carolina. About 26% of our generation capacity depends on water from, from the Catawba Water Re Hydro Project. Uh, we have two fossil stations, the Allen and McGuire stations uh, on, on our reservoirs on Lake Wiley and Lake Norman. Uh, two nuclear stations, McGuire, of course, on Lake Norman and, and then Catawba on Lake Wiley. We have 13 hydro stations along that chain of rivers and uh, we expect our electricity demand to, to double to more than double over the next 50 years with the population growth. Uh, it, the, the Catawba Water Reef System provides drinking water for uh, 1.5 million people, uh, uh, people uh, in, in the area. And you can see, the, uh, like the electrical demand, our, our demands on our water supply will increase as we have more people into the area. And then, of course, last but not least, I know a lot of people like to use Norman, we have over 16 million recreation visits along the Catawba Water Re uh, uh, for uh, recreation. Recreation is a big business, and we acknowledge that with our access on our lakes. And this just shows a schematic uh, of the Catawba Water Re systems from Lake James up in the mountain uh, to down at Lake Water Re. There are 13 hydro plants with 11 reservoirs. There's about a thousand vertical feet drop in 220 rivers miles. So you can see why there's a lot of hydro development on this river. And uh, the, our greatest storage for this system is Lake James, Lake Norman, and Lake Wiley. That's where we have the capacity to hold water during high flow events, or if we have droughts, we can have a lot of storage capacity there. So with that, Bill, I'll stop and entertain any questions. I know that was a lot to cover over uh, 20 minutes or so, but I do appreciate everybody's attention this afternoon. Any questions, uh, John? Okay. Uh, let's see. Well, uh, we have Cam Coley, I think, on the line. And as I mentioned when we began this program, I really had looked forward to one of the kind of real treats every year is the tour that we do of the water treatment and wastewater treatment plants and the opportunity to see that. And I, we had that scheduled and unfortunately with the pandemic, we weren't able to, to take advantage of that. But we have Cam Coley from Charlotte Water that's on the line and he's gonna walk us through a little bit about our water and wastewater treatment. So Cam, I'm gonna turn the program over to you and I'm gonna share the, uh, the uh, program that you sent over. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, first of all, we started operation in uh, 1899 and uh, we uh, had the towns join in the 1980s to consolidate utilities uh, for the whole county into one entity. Um, although uh, we serve the county, we are a city of Charlotte department but we do work with the towns on uh, what they need, uh, when they need it, kind of what projects are needed, uh, what growth do they predict, and, uh, and try to follow growth as best we can. So we'll go through some slides here. Uh, the first one, just to remind people, the three waters. Uh, we are the drinking water, wastewater side of things. Uh, there's a different department for stormwater, which is for rainwater. Um, so we uh, get the water from Lake Norman, treat it, clean it, test it, make sure it's clean enough for uh, uh, drinking and then deliver it to your house or business. And then when you're done with it, we collect it and send it back to the creek. Uh, again, through several stages of cleaning and uh, treatment and uh, testing along the way. And so when you get a water bill, you get the water bill uh, with uh, both of those, uh, storm water and uh, Charlotte water, but uh, there is a difference there. Uh, on this slide, uh, this just shows all the different facilities that we have. Uh, we have three drinking water plants, uh, several wastewater plants to uh, treat the wastewater. Um, the arrows on this map show that we are a regional utility. 
not only do we serve uh, our county, but there are agreements that we have with other counties to provide water uh, where they need water uh, assistance and to provide wastewater services and vice versa, where if it makes more sense from a uh, topo uh, topographical need uh, so that wastewater can flow downhill uh, to a, a wastewater plant in another county like Cabarrus, then we do that instead. And so we have uh, different agreements with other counties on uh, who serves what. Uh, we are AAA bond rated with uh, Fitch, Moody, Standard and Poor's. And, um, and so that's always important because that just shows that our financial planning, we're, we're always trying to keep our prices competitive and affordable, uh, but also make sure that we're planning ahead uh, and have the financial uh, strategy set so that uh, we're not having to take out loans at a higher rate. Uh, we serve a million people and um, uh, we'll go a little bit into the water treatment, wastewater treatment. Uh, since we can't show you uh, the tour like we normally do, uh, using these graphs to help you see uh, the process. If you've been to Blythe Landing, that's our intake for Huntersville, Cornelius, and Davidson. Uh, Lake Norman acts as our major reservoir. And so once it comes into our plant, we're going to use a, a, a called a liquid alum, but it's uh, like a kind of a, a liquid glue that takes all the stuff that's in the lake, all the particles, anything small that would be in Lake Norman and gets it to clump together. And so once it clumps together, then it will start to uh, drop into the bottom of our basin. So once it uh, does that, it's in a sedimentation basin where the water sits there for several hours. Uh, we then rake all that particle, all that stuff that's in the lake uh, away. We pull the water from the sedimentation basin, go through a filter. And if you have a filter at home, a Brita filter or anything like that, it's the same concept. The water starts at the top and it works its way down uh, through some coal or another media. Uh, in our case, our filters are 15 to 20 feet deep and it's anthracite coal, sand and gravel. So that when we're done with that uh, water flowing from top to bottom, at the bottom of our plant, it's uh, great H2O ready to drink. The only problem is you don't live at our plant. So we then put in some corrosion control uh, to uh, help make sure that the water has a uh, safe journey to uh, your home, um, that uh, we don't have any damaging of pipes or uh, corrosion issues. Uh, we add uh, fluoride for teeth. Uh, it's something we've been doing uh, for well over 60 years as part of uh, the health department. It's a great way to uh, reduce cavities throughout the county. Um, the, uh, the other part is chlorine because although the water is ready for us to drink at the plant, since it has to travel to your, your uh, home or business, it needs a little chlorine to help make it uh, get there safely. And uh, so when we're doing our tests, we're testing all along this process to make sure that the water, the source water is good, that the uh, water through the treatment process is good, and that if there's anything that shows up as an indicator uh, that something needs to be changed, we can change it. And uh, on the next slide, uh, this is just an overview of uh, Blythe Landing. Uh, that's our intake. Uh, and the next slide uh, shows an overview of our Huntersville facility. Uh, although this was uh, designed in the 80s and built in the early 90s, uh, same thing, we, we predict growth and uh, all of our facilities are built with the idea that over the next 100 plus years we're going to have to expand. So um, uh, we build them in, in, in that model of that we need to make sure that we can handle what's coming in the future. So uh, it is uh, redundant so that uh, we can take half the plant down for cleaning or maintenance and continue to serve the community, but also expandable so that uh, right now we do about 16 million gallons of water a day for uh, Huntersville, Cornelius and Davidson. On summer times, it'd be 25 million. On uh, the whole community, it would be 100 during the winter time and uh, 150 or more during the summertime. So uh, we have to have a, a lot of uh, uh, flexibility there, especially during the summertime for uh, irrigation and other uses. Uh, on the next slide, uh, this is just a view from the plant. Uh, if we were there, uh, this is a sedimentation basin and on the uh, the two people walking are, are our operators. 
they're looking at the one uh, on the right that's in use. The other one on the left is <laughs> being cleaned. And, uh, and then the photo on the right is it being drained where you can see that it needs some cleaning. And at the bottom of that photo are the rakes that would then scrape up all the particles and stuff from the lake water uh, to help get that uh, away. Um, and so that's just part of our system is cleaning and maintaining, uh, getting all that stuff that we collect along the way out of there so we can uh, continue to treat. On the next slide, uh, this is an old photo, but it's a photo of uh, a uh, water filter 15 to 20 feet deep. We have several of them and it looks dark at the bottom, but that's the anthracite coal, the start of the filter. And so that water would stop at the, uh, start at the top and stop in our basement and be ready uh, for use. And then we add the um, things we need to add so we can go out, we then pump it out to the uh, community. And uh, this gives you a quick sense of what our water pressure is like. Uh, we have uh, 11 storage tanks and uh, some other things that will help us create the pressure, but mostly your water pressure is created by the uh, difference between elevation of our storage tanks and your house. So if you live uh, with a creek in your backyard or the bottom of your neighborhood, then your pressure is likely to be higher than someone that is at the top of the hill or top of the neighborhood, uh, just purely by elevation. And so it's always a good reminder that if you are in a low elevation area, especially with the creek in their backyard, to uh, check and make sure you have a pressure reducing valve, consider it if you don't, or have your pressure checked uh, because uh, Water pressure is pretty much set by elevation uh, in most cases. Uh, if you buy water, uh, bottled water, uh, it could cost you a dollar for one uh, bottle, uh, but for us it's 259 gallons from the tap. So just a reminder that it's a great deal uh, in most cases to, uh, to use your tap water when, when possible. Although we do sell water for uh, people to create bottled water. So uh, that's also a great way to help the economy when you are uh, needing it for convenience. We do over 200,000 tests, uh, over 150,000 specifically on drinking water. Again, we test pretty much from the lake through the water treatment process throughout the communities. You may see green boxes uh, beside sidewalks. Those are our uh, sampling stations. We used to test inside uh, schools and libraries and other places, but we found that the green box is a better, faster solution so that uh, we can pull samples. If we find something that uh, has a concern for us, it doesn't meet our standards, then we will uh, continue doing additional samples immediately, find out what's going on. If we ever have a concern, and it's rare that we do, but if we do, um, we will uh, isolate that area, notify people that are in that area, and continue to figure out what's going on. That is considered an emergency to us. So. Uh, when that happens, uh, we immediately try to figure out what's going on and, and uh, get it resolved for customers. Sometimes it may be a private plumbing issue, um, but uh, that's just part of having uh, a lot of tests so that we can always keep a, a sense of what's going on in the community, not just at our plants, but even on the far reaches of the county. Uh, we have over 8,700 miles of water and wastewater. That's enough to get from here to Alaska and back or here to China. Uh, it's a lot of pipe. We have a lot of preventive maintenance. And um, if you see a leak and uh, you call it in, we are uh, going to come look at it as soon as possible. It could be, it, depending on the description, uh, we're there within 30 minutes or less. If it's uh, a small leak, you know, minimal damage, then it may take us a little bit longer. Then we prioritize those leaks so that uh, we can uh, adjust our staff where they need to be. So emergencies, things that are causing property damage, we will get to uh, immediately. Things that are a small nuisance leak, we'll get to as soon as we can uh, based on how long it's been there and how many other emergencies we've got going on. Uh, that's just uh, you know kind of part of uh, managing a system so big and of course with uh, wastewater if there's ever sewer spills or things we have to take those uh, as a highest priority. Uh, this is a quick view of kind of where your responsibility as a homeowner is. Uh, we maintain what's under the street. Uh, we maintain the hydrants, the meter, the meter box. 
the service line to the meter box, but pretty much whatever's behind the uh, meter box to the house is uh, up to the property owner. Uh, we get lots of calls in the winter time when pipes may freeze that uh, uh, people need to know where their master shutoff is. So it's always good to know where the master shutoff is to the building. Uh, and also you may say, oh, well, there's uh, been a water main break uh, on this street. There could be multiple water pipes under a street. Uh, there could be one serving those buildings and then one serving zip codes. So uh, we could have two or three water pipes uh, under a main street there. On the next slide, uh, same thing, wastewater. Uh, the person's clean out uh, could be closer to the street in the, uh, at the road right away or uh, closer to the house. Uh, we maintain what's in the road right of way and uh, the wastewater pipes under the street or in certain backyards if we have an easement. Another key thing here is the sewer vent that uh, your house may have uh, to help with uh, odors. And uh, sometimes people don't know that they have a sewer vent, but uh, just something uh, important to know about your, uh, your plumbing. If you, uh, if you have a sewer odor that's noticeable, it might be time to check and especially the clean out or uh, the vent, make sure you don't have a clog or something else prob uh, problematic coming. Uh, we have had uh, a lot of grease related wastewater spills over the years uh, where people have poured uh, fried uh, you know, fats, oils, grease down the drain, it clogs. It, it may start as a liquid, but eventually it uh, congeals and, and clogs the pipe. We've really knocked those down uh, to a much smaller amount. We uh, see uh, more uh, sewer overflows, which is wastewater coming out of a manhole um, uh, or pipes breaking uh, and spilling uh, into a creek, uh, either because of uh, other utilities damaging pipe, pipes failing over time, and also flushable wipes uh, that uh, people have used and, and put down the toilet. Even though it says flushable, it, that doesn't mean it breaks down. So it just works its way somewhere into our sewer pipe and clogs a pipe uh, eventually. So we've uh, done some communications. Uh, if we have a uh, grease related spill uh, in a community, we will send postcards out and do some education about what not to put down the kitchen sink. And on the next slide, uh, last year we did a um, uh, YouTube and, uh, and some advertising to remind people that pipes hate wipes. You can see these on our YouTube channel uh, if you uh, search Charlotte Water. Uh, they're quite entertaining. And um, as, uh, even though we will receive 100 to 150 plus million gallons of water uh, and serve that to the community as drinking water, 91 million on average is what comes back to us to treat. So we'll talk a little bit about how we treat that water to uh, get it clean enough to go back into our creeks. Uh, for wastewater treatment, when you send it, uh, it goes through a uh, pipe using gravity. Uh, those pipes are typically along the creeks. Uh, you may notice a morse uh, with the greenways. Uh, the main steps here are that we are going to, over time, take the solids out of the liquids and the liquids out of the solids. Uh, once we get the solids uh, as deliquefied or dewatered as much as possible, we will treat those and eventually, if it's good, we will uh, land apply that uh, for crops that are not for human consumption. Uh, the liquid will then go through several treatment processes disinfected and um, then go back into an area creek. Um, and on the next couple of slides, I'll show you a few views of it. This is the plant in Huntersville. And if you kind of follow the tree line uh, around uh, the bottom of the plant, that's how it comes in um, through pipes along uh, McDowell Creek. The uh, grit removal on the right side there is where we would start the process of removing the solids, uh, any of the uh, stuff that we receive that is not waste and is not uh, water, uh, say toys, rings, uh, whatever people may flush, those would show up there and be uh, landfilled. Uh, above that is the equalization basins. When we have those ma major storms, uh, then uh, even though the wastewater system is not meant to have rainwater, if it gets in, we can easily use that as an emergency 
place to uh, put that water. And I'll explain that a little bit more in a second here as to why that's important. Uh, the top left of the plant where uh, we have digesters is the solid side of things. And we would be uh, working that water try, uh, out of there, trying to get it as um, solid as we can into a cake. And then once we have it uh, as a good solid, then it's time to work it in, uh, create a biosolid out of it. The bottom left of the plant is uh, our water side where we are uh, continuing to get the waste, uh, the solids out of that water, clean the water, get it cleaner than the creek is itself. And then uh, when it's clean enough, then we uh, have it become what's called effluent, which is it's introduced back into the creek. Uh, a unknown part of the wastewater plant uh, that uh, always got people interested in, in the tour is the bugs. And we are a large bug farm. Uh, what we mean by that is that we have a lot of single cell organisms, microscopic organisms that love to eat the pollutants in the wastewater. And so we have these large basins, aeration basins, where we feed them oxygen, we feed them some sugar, and they eat the bad parts of the wastewater and help clean it up for us. It's a natural way to, uh, uh, to treat the wastewater without a lot of chemicals. And all we have to do is keep them happy. And so uh, uh, it's always part of the tour that uh, people were kind of surprised by. Uh, as part of that, instead of purchasing expensive chemicals to keep them happy, uh, we've had a, a long-term deal with sugar, water, uh, waste manufacturers, uh, soft drink manufacturers that uh, when they're done making the soft drinks, they have a lot of extra sugar that they have to offload. And instead of taking it to be uh, disposed of in other places, we've made deals with them where they can uh, bring the truck to us instead and we pay for the driver and the truck to come make the delivery. It saves us on chemicals, uh, which are more expensive, and it saves them on the disposal fees. So uh, it works out great for us and the bugs really like the uh, sugar wastewater uh, to uh, keep them happy and keep them eating the pollutants. And of course, uh, just like water, we are doing wastewater quality testing throughout the whole process. Uh, we have systems in place to test at the uh, various locations of the plant uh, as to how each piece is doing, but we also have ways to test all of the plant and get alerts. Uh, our staff is alerted whenever there's any kind of concern as to um, uh, anything out of sync. So uh, we have a lot of testing throughout the, uh, the plant to make sure everything's uh, optimal. And then this is a picture I took a long time ago of uh, our effluent of uh, where the wastewater, the treated wastewater enters back into McDowell Creek. And as you can see, it's a nice pretty uh, view of the uh, uh, creek and the uh, uh, plant. And what you notice is that there's not much of a difference. The, the only difference people may notice is that there's a little bit extra bubbles. And that's just as the uh, uh, wastewater comes in, it's been uh, going through a cascade or, or a step uh, and it kind of creates a lot of oxygen into that as part of our treatment process. So it just looks a little extra bubbly. And then we're on uh, several of the social media uh, uh, channels. So feel free to look for us, uh, use that as a way to communicate with us or check out more information. And uh, 311 is the best place to reach if uh, you have a question or concern, uh, if you see a sewer spill or have a concern about a water leak. If you uh, have a water leak and it hasn't been repaired um, and it's getting worse, let us know because it, it's, uh, it's ex extremely important for us to have everyone's eyes, ears, noses out in the community to let us know what they're seeing. Thank you. Anybody have any questions of Cam? Uh, again, I really wish you guys could have, have toured the facility, but uh, any, any questions of, of Cam and Charlotte Water? An interesting story, and Cam, I think I've told you, one of the local soft drink companies uh, had brought over their truck, and this is when they still had the branding on the truck. And uh, some of the leadership, Lake Norman folks, saw this particular soft drink company over there at the wastewater treatment facility, and they were like, oh my gosh, is that where that comes from? 
So I, they're a chamber member, so I got on the phone and called them. I said, you may want to take over a generic truck when you're offloading your sugars. Uh, and, and, and they have done that since, but uh, interesting story. Well, Cam, we certainly appreciate the time that you spent with us today going over that. And uh, hopefully, maybe sometime in the future, they can tour the uh, Charlotte Water facilities. We'd love that. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we're now going to move to Jeff Tart. Jeff Tart uh, is the 2020 Public Policy Chair of the Lake Norman Chamber of Commerce. He is the former North Carolina Senator for District 41, a former mayor for the town of Cornelius, and actually before he was uh, mayor of Cornelius, he was on the Parks and Rec Board. So he has worn a lot of hats. Uh, he is a small business owner whose wife is also in the healthcare industry. And one of the things we wanted to do is the Chamber last year put on a program where we brought together uh, representatives from Atrium, Novant, Lake Norman Regional Medical Center. And some of the comments made was, imagine if we could get some of our healthcare um, partners working together, particularly because we have so many things that are, that are popping up. Um, you know, we, we have the, the cancer clusters that we, uh, we've heard about in Huntersville imagine if we could get them working together. And so we've got Jeff Tart today, and he's going to talk a little bit about our Lake Norman Healthcare Collaborative. Uh, Jeff, I'm going to unmute you and, uh, or. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. And I'm going to share your screen and uh, I did download your program. So we're going to show uh, the Healthcare Collaborative screen. All right, great. You can go ahead and flip to the next. That's just the cover page. The, um, I guess, appreciate y'all having me here. I guess I do have a lot of formers in front of my name, <laughs> the things I've been doing. Uh, the collaborative started almost a year ago now. And the idea around it was to get in our community, uh, really a population health management program um, that we would be able to provide information to employers and the healthcare systems uh, to better take care of our population uh, using technology. So the real important aspect is we said we needed to really focus it, narrow it down to the content of what we would spend our time initially. And the mission, as you see in here, is to do predictive analytics around early identification of diseases. Initially, we're going to you know, start in the cancer area because we have, as Bill was alluding to, the ocular melanoma cluster uh, here and around the lake. We also have the uh, thyroid issue up towards the northern end uh, of the lake and particularly in the Mooresville area. And then we all know we're pretty familiar with colon cancer and some of the others. And we know what we want to do is use those as a foundation to build the analytics and the models that we can take that data and share it back again to the hospitals particularly so they can take care of the patients here. We're structured as a not-for-profit organization. Everything that we do as a work product eventually as we start doing this because we're very early will be to provide that at no cost back to everybody. And as you can imagine with the COVID, 19 pandemic in place, uh, we are looking to pivot a little bit. We've been asked, have, do we have the technology that will enable us to basically service two main components, and we'll get into these a little bit further, is around testing. Uh, how do we capture and, and uh, the analytics against that data? Because it's a metric, one of the seven metrics Governor Cooper has outlined that they want to track. And the second, which we're all getting a little more familiar with, is contact tracing. So in other words, you're in a seventh grade uh, class, math class. So who all was in that same math class if two of the students come down and test positive at their doctor's appointment? Or, and so how does that impact? Okay, you've got kids and you're both working, you know? So we need to help the employers know to keep uh, people productive. And as well, uh, looking at actual employment groups. So we're looking at some of the large employers uh, initially. Uh, firefighters are a group that we'll end up spending time with because it's a cohort we can get our hands around quickly. Nursing homes uh, are areas that we're logically looking at. Bill, if you want to flip slides, because some of this we'll talk to, 
this will give you, you know, if somebody asked us, and I've been describing a little bit of it, and I'll let you read along. I'm not going to read slides to you. Uh, and anybody that wants a set of these are welcome to them, by the way, is gives you a way we describe the collaborative and what we're all about, which is some of the things that we just talked about. Um, one thing that, as we put the group together, again, it's really started as a focus in the Lake Norman area with the employers, because this is an employer-driven initiative, uh, particularly under the umbrella of the chamber. And then we obviously go to the other uh, side of the equation where we need the hospitals involved because they're the ultimate care providers and the physicians. So we've had each of the major healthcare systems in the area participate. They're sharing resources, setting in on our monthly meetings and things. And then of course, the employers themselves. We have one of the gentlemen who's the chief executive officer for the employer association, which represents almost a thousand companies in the metro area is participating. And it's how do we leverage to provide a benefit for them. And part of that comes by keeping their employees healthy, sharing information about that without violating HIPAA and uh, PHI, private health information, all those things that we have to pay attention to as we go forward. Um, very important that we engage and employ really state of the uh, market technologies around cybersecurity. Uh, we're working as an open collaborative and by that, we will share everything we're doing uh, that's shareable, that's not under some kind of confidentiality and that being data. Most of the data that we will contain or hold on a patient will be de-identified. Uh, we're going to be working closely with the Department of Health and Human Services and Dr. Cohen's group in Raleigh, as well as um, SAS. I don't know how many people are comfortable or familiar with that company, rather. Uh, SAS is a big data analytics organization, one of the largest in the world, and it's actually headquartered over in Cary. That, uh, and they have something referred to, a uh, good thing to remember, is called the Government Data Analytics Center. And its acronym is referred to as GDAC. And a couple of years ago, there was legislation that passed that requires all healthcare information uh, that's collected by hospitals and physicians and care providers has to be sent to the state. And so a lot of the information we would use will be already at GDAC, at the Government Data Analytics Center, that we'll be looking at as well. Uh, if you go to the next slide, Bill. And this ge gives you an idea of kind of who we're starting to talk to and work with. We talked about the employers. We obviously know the patients um, that we're going to be working with and needing to be worked with, uh, as well as the entire health system. Uh, and that's hospitals, doctors, nurses, it can be a chiropractor's office. It can be, you know, anything along that line. There's actually even, as we're seeing it now, it's changing because of the virtual hospitals and virtual offices that are being created. So we will have to pivot on the access points where we get that information that we do use uh, as we go through this. The other aspect of the group that's maybe as important as the clinicians and that medical expertise in the group are going to be the data scientists. So we are working in collaboration with several of the universities. UNC Charlotte has a very pristine uh, and prestigious program around data analytics, around large data. We've got people who sit on the committee that are from organizations and uh, that work in this area because we will be applying certain technologies and you read a lot about them that we'll leverage, but it'll be in artificial intelligence machine learning, identity management, blockchain, will all be foundation technologies that we will have embedded in our solution set as we move forward and the platforms as we work with them. Um, and the, the last point, which is kind of interesting, you're gonna start reading more and more about this because uh, you see Apple, Google, others around the country are starting to do data collaboratives. And as I mentioned, we're gonna share our data with those groups get guidance so we kind of advance the ball sooner. I guess the best analogy is kind of like the whole vaccine area that we're doing with COVID right now. Average vaccine takes 10 to 15 years to get to market approved, FDA approvals, clinical trials, the whole bit. And yet they're hoping to have valid vaccines in place within a year uh, for COVID. And we're looking to move at that same kind of speed once we get funding and uh, structure in place. Bill? So what, what are we about? Again, it's, it's the idea is let's use cancer as the baseline. If we're doing predictive analytics, 
It would be our ability to take all the data that we know about a patient or an individual or a group of individuals in a geographic area, say the firefighters or a nursing home, and predict with a high degree of confidence uh, when you're likely to get uh, cancer or get COVID and predict it with some degree of accuracy. Part of the reasons to do that is let's use uh, co uh, colon cancer. It, and, and most cancers are a good example. If you catch and can identify a cancer in f stage one, the survival rates are like 85% or so or higher. If you catch that same cancer in stage three or four, those numbers invert. So we literally will save lives if we can get, you know, extremely good at doing this. Uh, and the accuracy will improve as we spend more time. Uh, there's people already doing it. And, the, and it will also make us much more efficient users of, and consumer of healthcare dollars. Uh, there's certain guidelines, as you know, with colonoscopies, some may know. With colonoscopies, they uh, start requiring or suggest that you start your first colonoscopy at age 50. But if we can collect and then do it, if you have polyps every five years, if you ha don't, you can come back every 10 years. Uh, mammographies, you know, they, start, they suggest you start doing that around age uh, 40 and establishing a baseline. But if you have cancer in your family, immediate family, and uh, a cousin, a mother, an aunt, then you need to start that earlier or establish a baseline. And if we can track those things from a genetics perspective, from patient uh, collected data perspective, uh, we have a much higher rate of telling you or determining when pr treatment protocols should change. So in other words, based on a population or a family history and tracking it, we may be able on a colonoscopy say, instead of waiting to 50, you probably should have a colonoscopy at age 35 uh, and, and have a higher uh, probability of catching it earlier versus the opposite effect. If there is none and we're looking at genetic and data around uh, an individual, you might theoretically never need a colonoscopy. So why spend it and have it done if it's not really required and gonna provide any benefit? So that, and what I just described is an overview of what is known as risk stratification. So that's, we're trying to minimize the, uh, the risk of needing a particular procedure and having, again, isolating the population that really needs a particular kind of treatment. Uh, that we're tracking as we go through this. All right, if you want to jump down, Bill. This just gives you an idea of, you know, we will seek outside funding. So this is all going to be donor and grant-based uh, organization. There's no fee, there's no profit uh, as we do this, as we mentioned. We've already started conversations with the state. There's federal grants and programs available, the Duke Endowments thing. So we are just uh, getting engaged and ready. And that starts because we officially got our 501c3 status from the IRS uh, a few weeks back. So we are, so anybody that wants to write checks tonight, uh, happy to do so because we are, you can write that off on your taxes now. It's a charitable contribution. So next slide, Bill. Okay, and, and so we, we've kind of talked about this already. Again, number one for the cancers is to get at stage one events earlier uh, to prevent, you know, obviously have a higher probability of survival uh, from that type of disease. But we know it occurs in diabetes uh, and things along that line. If we can change things in data about what you're doing and help provide that information from nutritional background, from genetics things that you're doing that uh, maybe weight uh, and obesity issues that we can help uh, programmatically identify and drive down. Uh, we know people who have weight loss that are, uh, you know, taking insulin actually come off insulin completely. I mean, we can have a lifestyle impact uh, as we go through this. And as we said, uh, what's in it for the employers? I mean, th there's a uh, motivation to make sure people stay healthier, able to go to work. They're less sick. The degree of, you know, severity, the acuity of their sickness is lower. So they're uh, out of work, less time, and uh, more productive. Bill? So this, these are the things we talked about uh, as far as which diseases early on. Again, the one thing that we will shift and, and look at is trying to pick up and help on the testing around the COVID-19. Uh, there's a lot of interest and in, uh, requests from us to be able to pivot and handle that data. Again, as we start, we'll focus on Lake Norman just from a geography uh, perspective and a scope of work. Start in and around the lake communities. That's a pretty big population. 
the firefighters would take us to us could take us to a statewide cohort early on as uh, the nursing homes could as well uh, but we'll expand it eventually across the state and potentially it will go nationally if some of the models and stuff demonstrate they're able to achieve what we're hoping as outcomes bill next one the um collaborative again this is just kind of where we are the steps we've been going through you know it's like any kind of startup business in a sense i mean we've had to put a charter together we've had to come up with mission statements we've had to define our purpose there's organizational structures uh as we go through all the banking accounting tax reporting um secretary of state reporting issues just like any other business that we have to build that structure around that we have to do but at the end of the day we will be building the platform uh that we do this on and we're using commercially available technologies kind of leading edge vendors to embed in the, our toolkit and at the same time one of the major initiatives that we'll be undergoing is two things collecting data and funding to handle uh the number of folks and the expertise that we bring into the organization that hopefully will end up having full-time staff, full-time facilities and that we utilize. So I'll let you flip to the next one. Uh, proactive results. This, these are things we've already talked about. So you can, I'll give you a minute just to kind of step through those as we've talked about all of that. And that's what the collaborative overall is about. Uh, early in its uh, initiative, it probably has about 18 to 20 members. Uh, so we have medical professionals, data scientists, we have consulting expertise. Uh, we've got people who do population health management. We've got media people, we've got businesses. So it's quite a cross section of expertise and interest in this area. So that's the collaborative. Any questions from anybody from uh, Jeff regarding the healthcare collaborative? Jeff also drives our public policy and there's been a lot of things going on and one of the things that we have next Friday is we're going to have a program 830 focus Friday and it's going to be on the stress that COVID-19 uh, has presented itself on business owners, managers, employees and families. Uh, Jeff you want to touch on that at all? Yeah we have two experts in the area, behavioral scientists, uh, that are coming, one from Atrium and one from Novant. They've been gracious enough to uh, give us their time. They're going to do an upfront overview of the types of issues that we're experiencing in the community uh, from COVID-19 specifically and the stresses it puts on. Uh, and I'm, we're gonna cover a pretty wide swath uh, of initiatives and then we'll have some Q&A with those individuals. Thank you, Jeff. A couple of uh, Chamber of Commerce announcements real quick. We, uh, the Small Business Administration had designated May 4th through the 11th to be Small Business Week long before the pandemic. And of course, that's been kicked down the road. We don't know when it's been postponed too, but we decided to go ahead this week and next week and not celebrate some uh, small business as much as honor small business. And so this week has been a, a whole series of events uh, today, uh, we're having a business mixer at 4.30. It's going to be virtual. Uh, if you can, join us. Tomorrow morning at 8.30, we're going to have a program on Zoom. You guys are joining us via Zoom, but we're actually going to talk about driving Zoom. If you're somebody that wants to host your meetings on Zoom, uh, we've got somebody who's going to go through and talk about how to operate Zoom. Next Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, we're partnering with WSIC. 105.9 radio in Statesville. They broadcast from Statesville down to Huntersville. We have three nationally renowned speakers that would cost a lot of money, but right now they're sitting at home and not actually out uh, speaking to groups. And so we have them Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Uh, Thursday, we have Dwayne Cashman. It's gonna be talking about selling uh, in this new post pandemic, although we're not through pandemic yet, but he's gonna be talking about how we're now going to engage in sales and then of course the focus friday next friday in the meantime we have a couple of documents that we put onto our website about starting back up uh, and, and uh, we also have a great document if you're a retail business on uh, that was put together by two national retail associations for retailers tomorrow we are going to publish 
a guide for restarting Lake Norman. Uh, we have that document. I'm proofing it now. I, I sent it over to Jeff today to look over, but we're going to send out this document. Uh, it is something that was created for us, to for our, all of our businesses, small businesses, corporations, everybody from, from A to Z, animal care, uh, right down to zoos, uh, how, how to handle and keep your office safe for your employees and for your clients and your customers. Uh, so a lot of things going on with the Chamber of Commerce. I would encourage everybody to look at the website at lakenormanchamber.org. Uh, as I mentioned, when I started this, uh, the adult uh, leadership, Lake Norman, we're probably going to kick the next session to July and so that we can actually tour facilities again. I think that's an important component. So you'll actually go to some of the attractions. So we'll probably be putting that together and then have graduation following that. Uh, the juniors that are still on the phone, we're going to uh, probably ask that you come back sometime in June when we feel it's safe, again, to bring groups of, of 20 or more together. But uh, that's the program for today. Uh, we're going, this is being recorded, so immediately when we conclude this, I'll go ahead and put it together, and I'll, I'll email it out to everybody, whether they were able to participate or not along with Mayor Anarillo's list of road improvement projects. Does anybody have any questions or any comments before we conclude today's Leadership Lake Norman program? No? Well, then I'm going to...